Thank you for watching the message today. We hope it blesses you. Your support of the ministry means so much to us. And we encourage you to share this video with your family and friends because it's an easy and simple way to share the gospel. If you'd like to support CWC financially, you can go to cwccs.org forward slash give. You can give on our CWC app or click the link in the bio if you're on YouTube. Now let's get into the message. God bless. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Pastor Nathan and uh, I have the honor to be able to get into God's word with you. Welcome everyone online as well. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Ralph for the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. Um, excited, very excited. Um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13, looking at verse 44. Hopefully you're already there. But I want to begin by asking everyone a question. Everybody, everybody good? Good? Okay, good. I want to begin by asking everyone a question, and that question is this. Have you ever treasured something so much that you were willing to sacrifice for it? Have you ever treasured something so much that you were willing to sacrifice anything just to have it? Now, I know that sacrificing isn't fun and nobody likes to sacrifice, but the truth is, is that we make sacrifices because in our hearts we treasure something so much that we're willing to give up what's important to us so that we can have something of greater value. You know, it could be the father who gives up something that he loves so he could spend more time with his kids. It could be the mom who sets aside some of her aspirations so that she could raise her kids at home. It could also be the person who sets aside time to get involved in their community or their local church. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is what do we treasure most? And here's why we have to ask that question. Because what you treasure will be what you sacrifice for. Now you might be thinking, I don't know if I treasure something enough to sacrifice for it. Well, I want to prove you wrong. Because I can guarantee you if we pulled up your social media right now, we'd be able to tell what you treasure. Maybe you're not into social media, but if we pulled up your bank accounts and saw what you spend your money on, we could probably tell what you treasure. Well, maybe you want to avoid your bank account right now. <laughs> you're like, that's it, me, that's me. <laughs> maybe you want to avoid your bank account. Well, then we could ask people that are close to you, what is it you're constantly talking about? They'll be able to tell you what you treasure because it's something that you constantly bring up in conversation. And it's not that these things aren't valuable, but when we look in the scriptures, Jesus shows us something of immensely greater value and that's the kingdom of heaven. So then the question becomes for all of us, would you be willing to sacrifice for the kingdom of heaven? We've sacrificed for all these other things. We've sacrificed for things that, that, we, that didn't have much value, but would we be willing to sacrifice for the kingdom of heaven? Not because that's what good Christians are supposed to do, but because we're confident that the return on our sacrifice is far greater and much more valuable than anything we could have given up. Sacrificing in such a way knowing that the return of what I get in the kingdom of heaven is way more valuable than what I could ever give up in this world. Do we do that? Is that our mindset? I think most of us miss this, including myself at times, where we don't think of the kingdom of heaven this way. In fact, we think of it as something that's off in the background, or we think of it as something only the pastor sacrifices for. When in reality, when we sacrifice for the kingdom of heaven, it's evidence that we treasure things that are in heaven and not on earth. You see, the problem even here with, within the church is that sometimes we get so distracted by running after and treasuring things that are earthly bound. In other words, it means that even if you gained everything that you could ever have, materialistic, money, whatever it is, you can't take any of it with you. So why do we invest so much of our time into things that are going to stay here? When we, when we see in scripture, Jesus says, I don't want you to invest your life in what's here. This is temporal, but you're gonna go to a place where things are eternal. And that is where our focus is to be as Christians. That's where we're to invest our life, not in things that rust and fade away, but in things that are eternal. Amen. Isn't that crazy? It's like, it's like the old you know, saying is that when, when you go to a funeral, you don't see a moving truck behind the hearse. 
because you can't take nothing with you. When you die in this, from this world, everything that you accumulated here is gone. So shouldn't that impact what we live our lives for? Shouldn't that impact where our focus is? That we're focused on the kingdom of heaven and investing in the kingdom of heaven rather than the things of this earth. I think there's a lot of believers in this room who would find a lot more joy in their life if they stopped trying to invest so much into earthly things and started focusing on the kingdom of heaven and living that way. Not just a Sunday thing, but living that way. And I'm not saying that it's, it's bad to have earthly things. I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But as a believer, especially, your focus should not be earthly, but heavenly. And that is what we are called to do. And I believe that this message is important because when we know how valuable the kingdom of heaven is, that is when we will experience great satisfaction. Not only will, will, will we experience great satisfaction, but we will be willing to sacrifice for it. I used to hate this question that preachers would say from the pulpit sometimes, and I'm going to say it to you now. Um, <laughs> I was like, that's, that's messed up. But I used to hate it when pastors would say, if everything in your life was taken away and all you had was Jesus, would you be content? Would you be happy? I remember hearing that for the first time and being like, no. <laughs> you thought I was gonna say yes? No, I mean, first, first time I heard that, I was like, nah, you know, like, I, I need stuff. I need to have things, you know what I mean? Like, I gotta have some stuff. I don't think I would be content. And at the moment, I didn't realize what, what, the, what these pastors were talking about when people would say something like that, when they would say, if everything was gone but all you, and all you had was Jesus, would you be happy? Would you be content? In fact, you would actually have all that you need. And I didn't realize that at the time, but it's true. Because if all that you have is Jesus, you have all that you need. Because even the things that you have right now come from Jesus. Amen. So everything you got or could get comes from him. So if he's the only one that you've got in the moment of desperation, then that's everything that you need. Amen. You may be sitting here right now or watching online thinking, man, I, I'm in a tough spot right now. And I don't have a lot of people around. But even, maybe even people have abandoned me. If you have Jesus with you, that is all that you need. You have all that you need to be satisfied. You have all that you need to be content. You have all that you need to find purpose and fulfillment because you have Jesus. That's a kingdom mentality. That's kingdom mindset. That's a kingdom treasure. So when we live this way, when we focus this way, as a result, we can actually live life focused on what really matters. Believers who live for the kingdom of heaven live life in, a, in such a way where they focus on things that actually matter. You see, we can be distracted by all these other things, but when we're living unto the kingdom of heaven, then we live lives that actually matter. Then we're doing something and investing our lives in something that is not just temporal and gonna pass away in a couple of years, but it is eternal. Something that we will even celebrate in the presence of Jesus himself when we step into heaven. And so in our study today, we will be looking at what makes the kingdom of heaven worth sacrificing for and what makes it so valuable by looking at three points. The first is the mysteries of the kingdom. Second, the value of the kingdom and the cost of the kingdom. Now, before we get even further into our text in Matthew chapter 13, I want to give us a little bit of context. And in this context, we see Jesus teaching to a large amount of people. It's a large crowd. And in this chapter, he's basically been teaching to this crowd for a long time, all day, basically. And then towards the end of the day, Jesus sends the crowd away. And finally, he's alone with his disciples. And his disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, Jesus, could you please teach us about the kingdom of heaven? Could you teach us again what that means? Because Jesus had just been teaching a whole big crowd. And now the disciples, as they're alone with their teacher, they're saying, God, could you please teach us, continue to have this conversation about the kingdom of heaven and what it's like. And so Jesus begins to teach them. And so as we see in verse 44, what Jesus says to his disciples is special because it's not for the crowds. What Jesus is about to share with his disciples is a private conversation. It is private information. This is something that he didn't say to the crowd, but he said to only his disciples. 
And as we get to get into scriptures this morning, we get to take a glimpse into what this conversation was like and learn from what Jesus says about the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at verse 44. It says, Jesus says here, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let me read that again. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. This brings us to our first point, which is mysteries of the kingdom. Now, the reason why Jesus says again, he says this over and over again through chapter 13, because he's trying to prove a point. But what he's using here to prove this point is what's called parables. He uses parables to communicate a specific point through story or through illustration. Basically, by definition, a parable is is a story of comparison that put alongside something else helps communicate a specific point or lesson. Now, even though this sounds great, there's a problem. Is that because parables, even though they communicated a specific point or lesson, when you would hear a parable, it wasn't always clear. It wasn't always that evident of what Jesus was trying to say. And the reason was because a parable basically presented a challenge for the listener. It was a challenge for the listener to find out what the meaning was on their own. That's what a parable was meant to do. Now, Jesus didn't always speak in parables. He was actually very plain in what he communicated to people all the way up to chapter 13 in Matthew. He was very plain in what he came to do. He was very clear in what he said he was about and what, and that he was going to die on the cross. All of these things, he's very, he was very clear. And as Jesus was teaching people, these crowds started to gather around him. And when we look at this, when we look at crowds gathering around Jesus, we might think to ourselves, man, I think Jesus is excited that the crowds are gathering. But Jesus knew the heart of man. And he knew that the crowds that gathered around him many times weren't there to learn from him, but they were there to be entertained by him. And so as a result, Jesus spoke in parables. He did not speak in clear terms, but he spoke in parables because he wanted those who were listening to not just be spoon-fed, but to go in and investigate what the meaning is. As a result, the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 13, 13, 10, and they asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says this. He said, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. This sounds kind of messed up, right? It's like, why can't everyone have the hidden mysteries of the kingdom? Why doesn't Jesus communicate that to everybody? Why is it just his disciples? Well, Jesus did this for two reasons. The first is because spiritual truth requires action. Parables present a challenge to the listener to not just allow spiritual truth to go in one ear and out the other, but it means investigating and meditating on God's word to figure out if the meaning is clear. In fact, that is what we're doing here. When you attend church, whether you're online or even in-house, when you come to church to hear the word of God spoken, make sure that you are paying attention, whether it's taking notes on your phone or writing it down, because what's being shared from God's word is not supposed to go in one ear and out the other, but it's supposed to be applied to your life in the week so that you grow spiritually, so that you don't look the same every week. That's the purpose of why we gather here. But if you gather here to be entertained by the pastor, if you gather here to, oh, because I'm just a fan of Pastor Al or whatever it is, then you are missing the point of why we're here. You need to take the word of God and apply it to your life so you grow. That's the purpose of why you're sitting in the seats that you're in right now. And nothing else. To come in and grow from God's word. So spiritual truth, when we hear it, it's supposed to require action taking it during the week and going, okay, this is what was said on Sunday. I'm gonna, how do I apply this to my life this week? How do, I, how, do I, how do I meditate on this so that I can make sure it's fresh so that I grow from it, not just listen to it? Because when you come to church and you don't apply what is spoken on Sunday through God's word, you are literally starving yourself as a believer. Because <laughs> as my dad has said, he's presenting meat and potatoes of God's word. But he can only present it. You're the one that's got to eat it and digest it. But if you don't do that, then don't question why you feel empty. 
Don't question why you feel like, man, I'm just not growing in my walk because you're not applying what's being said on Sunday. This is, it is not the pastor's responsibility to make you take God's food and digest it in your heart. That is something that God puts on each and every believer to take what is spoken from his word or even read in his word and apply it to your life. That's what it's about. That's why we gather. That's why we do this. But the second reason why Jesus speaks in parables is because he's fulfilling prophecy. And we see this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 6 verses 9 through 10. And this is God speaking to Israel. And it says this. God speaking, he says, go and tell this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Now, the reason why this was prophesied against Israel is because they had literally stopped their ears. They had stopped listening to the truth that God was trying to share with them. So much so that they rejected the prophets of God and even killed them. The truth is, is that when you reject the gospel, when you reject the word of God, it doesn't benefit you. It makes your heart hardened. It hardens your heart. It causes your heart to get to a place where you don't want to hear truth. Let me ask you this. Have you ever met someone whose heart, whose heart was hardened and they were okay with that? I don't know of anyone whose heart, at the core of them, whose heart is completely hardened and they're okay with that. They may be like that in front of other people, but I guarantee you in the private moments, they wish that their heart was tender, that they cared about people in a specific way. But if you're going to ignore the truth of God's word, this is what you have to do. You have to harden your heart. And when you harden your heart, you're not blessing yourself, you're making yourself more miserable because it's God's word that brings life. So you're literally hardening your heart to the one thing that can actually bring you the life and the happiness that you're seeking after. But how do we overcome that? It's by humbling ourselves and saying, God, I give you my heart. I submit my heart to you. And when we give our hearts to Christ, he tenderizes our hearts. He draws our hearts and makes us more like him. And just speaking to the guys real quick. I know when we talk about, you know, your heart being soft, and those guys are like, I, I want to be soft. I want to be hard. You know, I'm be hard. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm hard. I'm out in the streets. I will tell you this. A man who allows Christ to tenderize his heart is a man who will stand in righteousness and who is really considered a man's man. It don't take much to harden your heart. A boy can do that. But to allow your heart to be tender to the touch of Christ, that is a man who will stand for what is righteous. That is a man who will stand for what God has called him to stand, a man who knows who he's called to be. And for that, for that message, a woman as well. This is what God does to our hearts when we allow him to tenderize our hearts. Maybe, you're a belie- maybe you've been a believer for a long time and maybe you walked away from Christ. And you've hardened your heart to the truth of God's word. Maybe something happened, whatever it is. When you come to Christ and again present your heart to him, he doesn't reject you. He welcomes you. He says, man, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for this heart because I want your heart to be close to mine. I want to tenderize your heart so that you know what real strength is like. But the truth is, is that when we reject the truth of God's word, it hardens our hearts. And for the nation of Israel, it got so bad that they were willing to kill people who were trying to tell them the truth. We see a graphic example of this in Acts chapter 7, verses 57 and 58, where a young man named Stephen was telling the religious leaders in Israel the truth that they had rejected God's word. And scripture says that they reacted this way against him. It says they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They literally killed this guy because he was trying to tell them the truth. When your heart is hardened towards the gospel, it's not because you're right, but you cause your heart to become so hardened that you become hostile even to anyone who would try to share truth with you. I think that should be evidence that hardening your heart is not a good thing. If someone sharing truth with you causes you to get hostile, then there's something wrong there. 
Scripture is explicit in saying that when truth is shared, the wise man receives it. But those who become hostile are not wise. And so even as we see here in Scripture, when we reject that truth, it is not to our benefit. So kingdom treasure is accepting the challenge to not just allow spiritual truth to go in one ear and out the other, but applying it to our lives. Then we will know the value of the kingdom. And so going back to our text, Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, describes it as hidden treasure. Something with so much immeasurable value that anybody would be willing to sacrifice everything that they have just to have it. So we have to ask, what makes the kingdom of heaven so valuable? I believe that there are three benefits that communicate why the kingdom of heaven is so valuable. The first is peace with God. Peace with God. Now to understand this, we have to also look back at Genesis. Because in Genesis, we see what God originally intended and then kind of what fell, what fell apart. <laughs> you see, Adam and Eve, when they were put in the garden, Before they had sinned, they had peace with God. They had a relationship with God. Everything was great. But because of sin, you and I are born with a sin nature and a natural desire to rebel against God. We have a natural desire to rebel against God in sin. And sin makes us enemies of God. Now, to put this in perspective, I don't know if you've ever been in a fight with someone stronger than you, but it's not fun. So multiply that by a million and think about yourself being at war with God. That's not a good place to be. But that's exactly where we were. We were at war with God because of our sin, because of our natural rebellion against God. And what's crazy is that sometimes in our arrogance, we think that I can be a good enough person in my own ability to appease the wrath of God to think that in some way I can do enough good works to avoid God's judgment. That's arrogance. But this is also where Jesus steps in. Because even though we were lost in our sin, even though we were lost in our sin nature, Jesus stepped in and took our penalty of sin upon himself when he died on the cross for our sins and rose again three days later. And as a result, you and I have peace with God. We were hopeless, and yet Christ has redeemed us. So much so that we see in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 22, and it says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless above reproach in his sight. Listen, I don't know of any dictator that has ever told his enemies, I'm going to make you a part of my family. I'm going to reconcile and make you a son or a daughter of my kingdom. I don't know of any dictator that's ever done that, but we know Christ, God, has done that for you and I. Yeah. We are now reconciled to Christ. So much so that we are no longer enemies, but children of God. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. We were once enemies enemies of God, deserving of his wrath, deserving of his judgment. But because of what Christ has done, we are now sons and daughters of the king. We are now invited into this relationship with God that is exclusive in such a way that we have access even to the kingdom of heaven because we are in his family. That's a beautiful thing. That's amazing to know that, man, we were at odds with God. We were enemies of God. But now we are sons and daughters of God because we have peace with him. But not only that, the second reason why the kingdom of heaven is so valuable is because we have a personal relationship with God. But have you ever asked yourself this question? Why do we have a personal relationship with God and not some religious obligation? Do you realize every other religion has religious obligations? Either you gotta pray seven to eight times a day or you gotta do all these other things just so that you can appease whatever God they're worshiping. God didn't want that with us. He wanted a personal relationship, but where did this come from? If we again go back to the Garden of Eden, we see evidence of this because it says that Adam and Eve talked and walked with God in the cool of the day. They had a relationship with him that was face to face. 
But as a result of sin, that relationship was disconnected. But when you and I enter into a personal relationship with Jesus, that relationship is restored. We literally enter into what God had intended for mankind from the very beginning. When we enter into that personal relationship. And this relationship is not something that's based on what your mama thought or what your daddy thought or their relationship. This is a personal one-on-one relationship between you and the king yourself. That's what he wants with us. That's what he desired from the very beginning. And when we enter into that relationship with him, that relationship is restored. So much so that we have a beautiful guarantee. We have a promise from the spirit of God that our salvation is real. Ephesians chapter one, verse 13 says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom having believed you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. What does that mean? It means that for those of us who have given our lives to Jesus, we have a guarantee that we are saved from judgment. It is not something you have to hype up in your mind. It is not something you have to convince yourself of. It says that the spirit of God is the one who guarantees that to you that you are saved. In fact, you don't even have the ability to to confirm that on your own. It is only through the spirit of God that we are able to say, yes, I know Jesus Christ. It's not because you convinced yourself or you heard an argument of somebody or whatever it is or you have to hype yourself up every day. It is simply the spirit of God who confirms in your heart every day that you are a son or a daughter of Christ. He gives us that guarantee. And the Spirit not only confirms this, but he also gives us a new nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For people who give their lives to Jesus, who they used to be doesn't even exist anymore. You are a brand new creation. Yes. Now, sometimes when people come to know Jesus, they go, well, you know, I still struggle with things. How come I didn't wake up the next morning all saintly-like? I still have some words I struggle with saying. I still have some things I struggle with. Listen, the Holy Spirit, because of this new nature in you, is working in you. Listen, you are not a finished product. Just because you come to know Christ don't mean that you're a finished product. When you come to know Christ, that's like day one, bro. That's like day one. Like like from that moment on, you have a long journey. And in this journey, God's gonna be working on you and making you more like Christ. We can look at those who have been Christians for a long time and look at their lives and go, wow, they used to struggle with this stuff, but now they don't. Not because they're perfect, but because they've allowed Christ to work in them in such a way that he's moved things out of their lives. But that only happens as we are willing to submit ourselves to Christ. As we allow the spirit of God to work on us, we become more and more like his son. We become more and more like Jesus. And on top of that, remember how I said, we had a sin nature when we were born into this world because of Adam and Eve. The spirit of God not only gives us a new nature and makes us more like Christ, But in that moment that we become saved, we are now equipped to step over in victory over our sin. Because before we knew Christ, we were lost in our sin nature. We were lost and and enslaved to our sin. But when you give your life to Jesus, you are infilled with the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, you have the ability to say no to sin. You have the ability to walk in victory over sin. So for the believer, we can't say things like, the devil made me do it. Because if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he can't make you do nothing. You are empowered with the power of God to say no to sin, to walk in victory over over sin, and walk in victory in your life. Because the Spirit of God gives you the ability to do that. That's not something that you can sit down and go, okay, here's how I'm going to map this out. No, it is by the Spirit of God that you walk in victory over sin in our lives. And so even in all of this, in this personal relationship, As a result, as a believer, we are motivated to build the kingdom of heaven through fulfilling the great commission by how we live our lives. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus, suddenly your focus is different. You have a kingdom focus. And now it's about building the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the earth is gonna pass away. 
So we invest our lives in what really matters. The third thing, the third reason why the kingdom of heaven is so valuable is because we have a new home. Earth is no longer our final destination. We have a new home. John 14 verses two through three, Jesus says this. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I love to emphasize that part because Jesus is lying. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Yes. You see, Christ didn't just leave us as orphans. Scripture is explicit in saying that. We are not left here as orphans, but our king is coming soon. And he will take us to be where he is right now. But in order to get there, we have to understand something. We have to understand that in order to get to, this, to, the, to our new home, we have to be absent from the body. Based on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And to be absent from the body simply means physical death. And so when we die, the spirit that is in us is separated from our physical body. And our spirit enters into an eternal state. And even though that sounds okay, that, thanks for sharing that, but isn't death supposed to be a, a bad thing? Death for the believer is not to be some unknown thing that we have to fear. But in fact, death for the believer is like a graduation. It is like a graduation. We go home to be with our king and see him face to face because right now, even though we have a personal relationship with God, we can only see him dimly as scripture talks about. We see him as though a a dirty mirror or a dim mirror, but one day we will see him face to face. There will be nothing in, in, in the way. There will be no barrier. We'll be able to see him as he is. That's the beautiful thing, but it gets better because every sin, every sorrow, every pain will be wiped away. And I think that's so important that we remember that even as believers is because sometimes we live life like we're trying to avoid every aspect of pain on this earth. When God is telling us on this planet, you will have tribulation. Stop acting like this is supposed to be where everything is supposed to work right for you because this ain't where it's supposed to happen. When we go to be in heaven, that is where we have no pain, no sorrow, no sin. So while we're here, Jesus said, you will have tribulation, but fear not for I have overcome the world. So we have hope even though we go through hard things, even though we go through pain, we have hope because Christ has overcome. And if he has overcome, then so will we. That's what we can be encouraged by. He's with you. He's walking with you. We have to get out of this mindset that this life is supposed to be the best life that we can live. That's the one to come. So while we're here, let's invest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's invest in things that actually matter. Let's invest our lives in changing other people's lives and showing them the same personal relationship we have in Christ that we have. Lastly, the third added bonus is that when we get to heaven and see Jesus, we will also be reunited with those who have gone before us. Family members, friends, we will see them again. And not for a short time this time. Not for an unknown amount of time, but for all eternity. And so, when we see how valuable the kingdom of heaven is, then we will understand the cost of the kingdom. So if we go back to our text, notice here something very odd. It says here, when a man found, when the man found the treasure, he didn't just pick it up and book it. Like he didn't just pick it up and run with it. He hid it. He buried it. Why? Now that doesn't make any sense to us because we know that in 2020, if we found you know, a dollar on the street, we wouldn't like leave it there. We'd be like, ha ha, dollar. Like, you know what I mean? We'd we'd be running. (laughs) People would be like, hey, did you find a dollar? I'd be like, nah, I ain't find nothing. (laughs) You should go look though. Uh, But I I don't know, I ain't see nothing. (laughs) We would do that with a dollar. So you imagine, 
with treasure. You know, this person, he, he finds this treasure, but then he just covers it up and hides it and then leaves. Why did he do that? Well, according to Jewish culture, if you found treasure or something buried in a field that didn't belong to you, you couldn't claim it. So that's why he hid it. He found it and was like, oh, man, I found this. Okay, I got to bury this and I got I to gotta go. And what he did was that he went for, and, and for joy over it, he sells everything that he has to buy the field. Because again, according to Jewish tradition, if, you, if he didn't own that field, he couldn't claim the treasure. So he sold everything that he had, everything of value to him, so he could go purchase this field so he could right, rightfully be able to claim the treasure. That's why he did that. And the thing I want to point out here is that the person who sold this, sold their stuff, they didn't do it with drudgery. They didn't do it with, oh, like, I'm never going to see this stuff again. I'm, I, I can't believe I got to give this stuff up. He did it with joy. He said, no, I'm getting rid of everything so that I can have this one thing. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Listen, you may be searching this morning, you may be watching online and searching this morning, but I guarantee you that when you come in contact with the kingdom of heaven, all the other riches you think you have will look like nothing compared to the kingdom of heaven. When you come in contact with the sweetness of who Jesus is and what he's done for you, everything else, the, you know, you know positivity or, or what, whatever Confucius say or whatever it is, is nothing compared to what we find in Jesus. This is the treasure that this man found. This is the treasure that he willingly, joyfully said, I'm going to get rid of everything else of value, anything else that I used to take pleasure in, I'm getting rid of all of it so that I can have this treasure. What's crazy is that The question that I asked in the beginning, you know, if all you had was Jesus, would you be happy? This is where this comes to light. Because remember, in this moment, this man who sold everything had nothing left. He had nothing left to his name. And all he had was this treasure. In that moment, he was satisfied. In that moment, he wanted nothing else. And that's what, this, that's what, when we enter into a relationship with God, that's what happens. We don't want anything else. Even if we've accumulated treasures, we've done all these other things, we've gathered all these other things from different religions, whatever it is, when we finally come in contact with the treasure of God, the kingdom of heaven, that is when we're finally fulfilled. That's when we're finally satisfied. And again, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that in any way that you can try to purchase the kingdom of heaven, like, you know, you're gonna go out and sell your house or sell your car and sell all your possessions and stuff like that and come in here and be like, Nathan, I sold everything so I can have the kingdom. I'm gonna tell you to go get your stuff back. Um, <laughs> but we're not talking about materialistic possessions here. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. You see, this treasure that this man found was so valuable that even if this was the only thing that he had, he was happy and content. And in that is the gospel. Because when you come in contact with Jesus, he ought to be the thing that you are most happy with, the thing that you treasure the most. In fact, if you want to identify an unhappy and frustrated Christian, I will show you someone who's not treasuring the kingdom of heaven the way it ought to be treasured. There are a lot of people in the church today who call themselves believers but yet are frustrated. Why? Because they're not treasuring the kingdom of heaven the way they ought to. And here's what I mean. Sometimes we treat God like he's a, a commodity. He's that thing we dust off on, on Sundays just so we can get our, our, our Bible time in or our church time or whatever it is. But the truth is, is that God did not come into our lives to be a commodity. He came into our lives to consume our lives. And when Christ is not consuming you, Christian, you are going to be miserable. Because like, like my dad has said, you will know just enough of Christ to make yourself miserable. 
When the believer is not treasuring Christ with everything that they are, where their life is centered around Christ, if they're not doing that, they are going to be miserable because there's gonna be something inside you being the Holy Spirit that is gonna say, man, follow Christ. Give your everything to him. Don't do this half-heartedly. Give everything that you have to following him. And then I tell you, believer, you will find happiness. But again, here's a warning. Jesus says in Revelation that those who are lukewarm, he will spit out of his mouth. That's talking about people who do not give their whole heart, their whole lives to Christ. You cannot follow God and sit on the fence with your heart. You cannot follow God and sit on the fence with your life. He is either encompassing all of it or none of it. If you want to make yourself miserable, then hold back a part of your heart from the Lord. But those who know their purpose, those who find purpose, those who who know what Christ is doing in their lives are those who have said, God, I'm going to allow you to consume everything that I am. Those who do that, like Jesus said, are his disciples. They're following him. And again, I'm not speaking about this because, uh, man, I've, I've come to a place where I've arrived and I figured it out and I'm just sharing it with you guys. Like, ha no. Like, all this stuff I'm saying to you, God had to bring it through me first. And God had to show me in my own heart, like, man, there are times when I come to God and I just treat him like this thing that I just kind of carry around like he's there, and, but he's not really the center and the focus of my life. And it made me miserable. I'm supposed to be following the Lord, but I'm miserable. But Christ has been showing me that, man, when you go all in, and and everybody knows what that means for everybody. Your all in may not look like Pastor Rao's all in, or my all in, or someone else's all in. You know what it means for you to be all in for the Lord. And when you do that, when you walk in such a way that you're going all in where, man, God, I'm centering everything around me. I'm treasuring everything that you are in my life. That is when we find happiness. That is when we find victory over sin. When we're all in. Not half-hearted, not holding back parts of us, but willing to say, God, I'm not holding anything back. I'm going all in and I'm treasuring you above anything and everything else. In conclusion, In a lot of ways, this parable is really about finding the ultimate treasure and being satisfied with it. Because the truth is, is that if we have the treasure that is the kingdom of heaven, meaning Christ in us, then we really have all that we need. And if we really have all that we need, then we can focus on living a life focused on things that actually matter. And that's investing in the kingdom of heaven. Again, thank you for watching and supporting the ministry today. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and like the video. If you want to watch the sermons live, we live stream every Sunday at 10 a.m. on our app and website at cwccs.org. Have a blessed rest of your day. God bless.